We've got Asher J. Hi, Paul. It's great to see you again. How are you? All right? Doing well. Yes, I'm well. I see you in D.C. or somewhere. So thanks for, very much for joining us. Very happy to see your tweet this morning. Right, I'm going to disappear, um, leave you two together, but I'll be watching closely. Have fun. That's trouble. You can't leave the two of us unattended, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> I can attest to that many times. Yeah, we've gotten up to a lot of fun at party we time. We have, and this is just the latest adventure that we get to have <laughs> together. And I'm excited that we get to share what you do, which is translate your art and creativity and unique perspective to conservation and protecting the planet and making raising awareness in a way that appeals to, I think, a much broader audience than, you know, potentially just science or just communication. You kind of bring it all together in a really unique way. So I'm excited to see what you've got uh, in your back, you know, up your sleeve for today. So I don't want to keep you go from going, but what do we, what do we get? What do we get? Next? then i've had my coffee i'm ready to fire away <laughs> you are ready and ready to go <laughs> careful everyone she's highly caffeinated and very creative so this will be a great ride for the next uh 25 to 30 minutes i guess we've got going on um where and, do you, you call it where you call questions. i'm calling from montana today because i've uh, had a recent change of heart and living space uh from living in manhattan new york to being in rural Montana in dark sky country with absolutely no street lights and no pollution. Oh, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. So like we've been telling everyone to go out and like look in their backyards, you know, share some of their backyard biodiversity. You've got it all right there. You've got I, a expansive I've got backyard. Black bears, I've got skunks, I've got the whole nine yards. I mean, I get to see the <laughs> So plenty of biodiversity inspiration. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's also, you know, for a person who's been in a city for so long and studying humanity under the filter and lens of biodiversity, because we're like our own little species of, of just like diversity and resilience within our own, within a singular, we're plural, which is kind of interesting yep. and uh, not often pre like encountered when you're out in the jungle, because you can expe expect chimpanzees to behave a certain way, but humanity can be any way on the spectrum on any given day, especially in New York. Um, so <laughs> that is definitely a microcosm study. of biodiversity yeah. in the human species. Yeah, you have the <laughs> every individuals, you have like completely passive prey species running around, you know, and it's all within the human race, which is really interesting for me to observe on any given day. Um, so I, for me, you know, the very definition of biodiversity is very unique in that I look at humanity as being a part of that in every aspect. And sometimes I focus just on communities and see how how their internal diversity can contribute to the resilience of how they find expression, whether it's a highly developed uh, state of being where, you know, we're highly industrialized and focus ourselves on progress, or if it's looking at us on the ground level where we have deeper connection to nature and our backyard resources. So just understanding how we play into the role of overall biodiversity, especially when you look at where we're at as a species in today's world, we occupy like the majority of the landscape, right? We're yep. like over 90% of like global biomass. And yeah, you know, you can say that like there are lots more ants than, than you can count, but at the same time, in terms of our footprint, we are everywhere. There's no yep. such thing as extremely pristine universe that has been completely untouched by human activities or agenda yeah. in some capacity and so you can now say that about the whole solar system i mean with voyager going past pluto <laughs> we've impacted the entire solar system i know we leave waste everywhere we go we're like i've tossed that tall satellite in pieces across like space as space debris um just like we do it in the oceans you know? so like i think it's funny i love neil deGrasse tyson and people who are all about you know space exploration and I remember very distinctly at one of his star talks, he told he told to the audience, he was like, you know, why why wait for the day that we need to like finish exploring the cave to get out to explore more? Like we need to be out there seeing more, and that's why we go into space. Like we don't wait yep. to solve all that has to happen inside a cave in order to be out there. But I completely disagree with that. I mean, that's why we leave junk everywhere we go. We haven't figured it out at a very core level within ourselves and in our immediate backyard. So naturally, when we go elsewhere, we're gonna take all of our this mess, bad with habits us, with us. Yeah. 
And so I feel like, you know, we're just replicating a failing model and paradigm everywhere we go. So like, yeah, initially when I started out, it's so funny that my career is not like a linear trajectory. Everybody else. Like, no one else is, is by the way, like I, I'm a prime example. I think everyone who's watching can be like, yeah, there was that moment. I thought it was going here and then ended up going there. We can all attest to that. Some people think, you know, especially when you're young, you think like you've studied something and then you're going to get a career in that, right? Like as you think in university, you're going to specialize in something and that's where you're going to apply. I don't apply what I studied at all. Like I, to, maybe to some extent, like the design principles, like I do think right. designer, but I don't do anything related to fashion right now. And, and I don't think I, I would want to get into the industry in the way that I was taught to get into the industry. Um, so I think a lot of it, especially in this tribe, Nat Geo, like we're such outliers. Like we all started somewhere and wound up somewhere else, sold our homes along the way. Yep. And, you know, gave up material possessions and decided to invest in like renewable energies instead. And do, we do crazy things. That's what we are. Um, and even in my own class, when I graduated, just my class of like explorers were all outliers. And that's what gives you like sort of a strength to be you because you know, there are others like you out there who are just- That is very true. Right? West and it's inspiring to see outliers showcasing the work they do because you realize, oh, if I'm an outlier, that's okay. Or an original, that's yeah. another one. That's something different and stands out. And I'd say for it, you and definitely qual fall a little bit more into the original than outlier, or maybe it's a nice combination of both. And sure. your work proves that. I mean, the great work that you have. Are we going to see some of that today? Yeah, or I'm going, show, I'm going to show and walk you guys through it. Um, great. I just wanted to quickly pull up. Hold on. So I have two yeah, definitely. We're, I'm excited to see more. It's been a while since I've seen new art. We've hung out and shared stories or no, you know, caught no. up. So this is great for me. I get to like catch up with one of my friends and it, with everyone else at the same time. And I get the opportunity to see you after I think a year or so, which is crazy. I and know. As long as we've got each other. I agree. Okay, well, so now it's all you. I'm going to turn the screen over. You want to okay. share that full screen so we can see everything. And uh, how do I do that? Hold on one second. Uh, I've never really mastered share screen in the best way. Yeah, so down at the bottom, there you go. That button should turn to full screen. There we go. Look at you. You did it. All right. <laughs> Now I'm going to turn the show over to Asher. Everyone enjoy the presentation and learn a little bit about her creative creative insights and spark. So when I started out, I had this deficit as a creative person. I was slightly handicapped because I had studied sciences in school and gotten into university under the fashion design uh, label. And so when when I was working through illustration, I didn't have the skill sets to communicate the complex narratives of our world um, as soon as I graduated. And so I started out using like two dimensional silhouettes or just things that were easier for me to like illustrate because I couldn't actually do it in a, in a three dimensional capacity at that point. But over time, it just became my creative aesthetic. It became my sensibility. And this is what I'm now known for is the style of art, uh, which actually began as a limitation, not, not as a choice. Um, and so here we have, you know, one of the initial concepts that became my why behind why I do all of the stuff that I do. Like, why even create the campaigns? Why create the art? And it's utterly to empower each and every one of you who's watching to change your habits, to look within and come into an alignment that acknowledges your own storyline, which is inextricably linked to the diversity around you that has helped you evolve into the complex individual that you are. And that's not just immediate life circumstances, but it's also your biological and evolutionary history, which we often take for granted, which is evident in just how we treat the organisms that helped us become human. So for me, it's about acknowledging not just our immediate lineage and narrative, but looking at that whole in a way that truly allows us to move forward inclusively. Oftentimes we look at one part of the story and not the total. Um, and that's why you result in design situations and design frameworks that are cradle to grave, which was to say that we result in waste, like we were talking about, whether it's space debris or, you know, junk in the ocean, that plastic smog in the ocean. Um, so I really think it's about us being more effective and taking inspiration from nature and bioengineering solutions, such that we don't create products or services that result in emissions and waste that we cannot repurpose back as a resource into creating 
more that is beneficial for the whole. And for that, we need to take the whole into account at the very beginning. And that's what design thinking is all about, is truly to look at a system from start to finish and bring it back into itself, as opposed to leaving it kind of incomplete and left for someone else to pick up and resolve, which is what most corporations have been doing so far. When I began, I was working more with just communicating environmental narratives and looking at how we can spearhead human stewardship. And so I worked a lot with nonprofits on campaigns um, from, you know, working on oil crises like this one here, which illustrates us evolving into the Grim Reaper, a very bleak future to present for ourselves. And we're essentially pumping life with death. So what's wrong about this picture? The fact that we haven't learned a lesson despite history having repeatedly asserted for us that this is not going to work in the long haul. I mean, just if you look at climate change conversations at present, we are pumping into a storyline that is not working in our best interest. So this is, this is to say that we're not really being intelligent and we're capable of solving for this simply by reallocating the resources that we put into a failing paradigm toward a successful one. And so I tried it incite awareness and therefore enable action in people through very quick contrasting imagery, animations, um, campaigns, graphic illustrations, uh, build, like taking over mass media spots like billboards, um, you know, uh, train stations, anywhere where you have a lot of foot traffic and there are a lot of eyes on a spot, whether it's on the side of a train or a bus stop or um, just looking at places where people congregate. Um, I actually did a pop-up installation for Brita recently in Toronto where I recreated the Niagara Falls of plastic bottles to help people visualize the amount of plastic being consumed in the form of just disposable single use or like in terms of like plastic water bottles, uh, how many are being consumed just because you don't filter your own water or drink from the tap. And so just having people see their footprint in real time in fi like five seconds was literally 900 bottles. You know, that's a large number of bottles to cast away out of ignorance. So how can you get people to see it and internalize the data set or the number in a, in a way where they feel the impact of their action and therefore can realize that that impact can then be translated into something more positive by just saying, I'm not going to participate in being a part of the problem anymore. I want to be in, involved in making solutions, find expression. And so in helping them see it quickly, like basically what I do is images that are like tweets, you know, it's just like a quick blast of like information that makes it intuitive, easy to internalize and possibly strikes an emotional chord because if you don't strike that emotional chord um, and I say possibly because not everyone's going to respond to an image the same way and they may just not care at all you know um, and so there are demographics that are going to interface with your work that don't feel incited emotionally but they might then care about seeing it conceptually or intellectually so I layer the work as much as possible to have every aspect of a human being you know psychological physical emotional and um, even spiritual, because if you feel that deeper connection that is like more energetically aligned within yourself and with the world around you, where you just feel what it means to be alive, to feel intrinsically connected to life at large, that's a beautiful space to be. Very few people are actually there because it takes this real commitment to being present. Um, and, and not very many people are actually present because they're so trapped in their timeline of being, oh, what happened yesterday and what's going to happen 10 years from now. And that's even in the conservation community, right? Like we project for doom and gloom scenarios all the time. Like, oh, you know, you have a decade to get it together. If not, the whole world's coming to an end. But that's not where we are right now. Where we are right now, there's still so much worth saving. There's so much beauty around us. I mean, I keep looking this way because it's like right outside my door and windows, but there's so much here right now and i'm trying to get people to be more present so that they can take stock of what is around them in order to change how they participate and show up in this instant at hand um, and yes you might have been you know throwing plastic bottles away until yesterday but maybe today is the day that you change your habit and i've seen that happen here in in montana where it's very different um community than what I'm used to in New York, where people are far more conscientious and conscious of like their footprints and, and are constantly having conversations about being, you know, a conscious consumer. And that's not something that's as prevalent out here is what I realized. And when I met some people, you know, they were like, oh, I don't even care, like whatever, you know, it's just going to be what it's going to be. I might as well live my best life and throw what I want away. And then 
we're all going to die anyway. Like that's where some people are at over here. And I told her, I was like, yeah, but you can choose today to not add further to what is not working. You can change your habit. And in doing so, you can empower yet others to follow suit. And therefore this will no longer even be a problem. Like why is this a doomed narrative? And it's not set in stone, but we, you act like you're just resigned to a failed system and a failing system. And that's not the case. Like you can change it today. And literally the same woman who told me that she doesn't care about her plastic footprint turned around and within six months launched an, a renewable energy bike company locally and has been very actively uh, working with local government to figure out ways to address our waste management issue. So, and it's really bad over here. We don't recycle very much. So that's something I'm actively campaigning for daily, but here's, here's how you can change the world around you is by being engaged, by caring in this moment and not giving up on those people who don't know better, who don't care yet, because they can change too, because you changed, I changed, why not them, you know? So don't lose hope, don't lose faith, don't get into those like doom and gloom, I'm resigned, like everything is lost, everything is dying, biodiversity is doomed, because it's not. There's so much happening around the world and there's so many people like you and I who care to make that impact and drive change forward in a positive way. I always focus on the premise of plot, which is to say, you know, you need to define the problem set, like be very clear in your question articulation. This is the core of design thinking is to not just come up with form, which is artistic and beautiful. And you can think of art for art's sake, but I'm more a designer than an artist. And so I look at framing a very tight question that hits the core of what it is that I'm trying to address or come up with a solution for. And when you do it that way, your question itself will have the words that will come to frame the answer. Then you have to look at how you express it. Like what language are you communicating this in and how much of the ideology concepts and thoughts and, and phrasing comes from that language? And is there a barrier between your articulation of it? And if you were to translate it to some other language, say Swahili or Chinese or anything else, will that concept and idea or thought be lost in translation? And oftentimes it is. So you have to be deeply mindful of the cultural bias that is inherent in just language, whether it's visual communications and the iconography and science semiotics that you can you know, defer to, or if it's actual spoken language, even there you have idioms and sayings and, and ways of thinking that may just not translate. Case in point being a, a campaign that we were trying to run where there was no word for bushmeat in Swahili. And so we had to figure out a way to reach the people and educate them on, yes, you cannot be culling wildlife, but you can eat livestock because this is a dissonance that we have resolved in the West for ourselves. So we don't mind eating cattle, but we take issue with eating a tiger. But if you go to places where there is greater um, daily uh, access to wildlife, there is chances of consuming that wildlife because they just don't have access to eating livestock. And also livestock in those countries are often more expensive than just going and killing a zebra in, or wildebeest in your backyard and eating that. So just, you have to understand who it is you're speaking to, have the sensitivity to be inclusive and have a conversation as opposed to being judgmental and going in from your bias into a, a storyline that you know nothing about. So the first thing I do as a creative person working on these kind of stories is to have the capacity to listen to all sides of the conversation before I start articulating anything as a visual that is then going to reach the larger public and educate them about the topic at hand. I always say state what's obvious because you often take for granted what people know and people don't all know the same thing in the same way. We don't even look at the sun and see the same sun. You know, if you ask 10 people to sit around you and draw a sun, no two suns will look exactly alike. So that's how subjective we are. Speaking of us being diversity as well, you know, we are not all the same. And so have respect and compassion for that difference because when we can account for that difference, we can come together in uh, unison in a way that allows for the most cohesive, complex expression and iteration of a concept, of a thought, of an ideology, of a solution. So account for what's obvious. So like you might think it's obvious to you, but it may not be obvious to very many. One of the campaigns we ran as a um, 
crowdsourced effort was a billboard I did in Times Square against the ivory trade. And one of the first questions that came out of it, uh, the campaign read, you know, uh, ivory lasts forever, so does extinction. Every tusk costs a life and destroys a family. Is it worth it? And the number one question we got in our survey was what is ivory? And I, even though there was an elephant illustrated in it, it wasn't obvious to people that the word related to the task related to the elephant. And so, you know, you might think it's obvious, I might think it's obvious, maybe it's in the newspapers every day and we read certain newspapers, but not everyone thinks and knows the same information. So always make sure that the audience you're communicating to is on the same page, so that your foundation is shared in order for you to divulge any further information that can then come to enrich them always embed emotional triggers because by the end of the day, we're feeling creatures, we're not thinking creatures. So if you don't get people to feel, you're not going to get them to change their attitudes because when you know something, it's great, but like you need to fall in love with something in order to truly care about it. Um, sometimes it's just a matter of changing public perception. So when I worked with Wyoming Trapped, for instance, they were campaigning against trapping and they were putting out images like this, you know? But I was like, but you're Wyoming, your whole campaign and the nonprofit's name even was Wyoming Untrapped. So what they were advocating for and wanted to realize in the world around them was the solution, not the problem. So you have to be conscious of the fact that you don't want to visualize the problem if it is the solution that you're advocating for. So why not show this? This is what Wyoming Untrapped could look like, you know? So sometimes I don't even use my own work. I'm more strategic in, in helping with the branding and communications. And I approach it such that I can help them use what arsenal of visual assets or um, content they already have in a new way so that they, it is more powerful, you know? So this is the visualization of the solution and this is what they want the world to look like. So I'm like, start using this kind of language and this kind of imagery and you'll get toward realizing more of the solution because that's where your attention is, that's where your focus is, and therefore you're directing public focus towards this and not this. Um, because what we put our energy and attention on is what we end up getting more of, you know? Like the more you put the negative out there, the more fear you seed, the more helplessness, hopelessness, sorrow, depression, it's all the antagonistic, counterproductive, unhealthy, reactive states of emotional being, as opposed to proactive, uh, problem solving, objective, actively engaged, being present. That's, that's what wild is like. So take a page out of nature and be present and proactive as opposed to constantly reactive. So much of the conservation movement, particularly when focused around biodiversity, which we tend to take more personally than biodiversity does is, is why it's not working, you know, because we make it so anthropomorphic. We put such a human element of sorrow and horror and sadness into it. But, you know, it is, it is unfortunate what it is, what is happening in many parts of the world. And yes, we are highly exploitative species sometimes. And some of us do take in very, very unhealthy, unsustainable ways, but Focusing on that is not going to change what that change or stop that from happening. And so it is important for us to put our attention where we need it to be in order to keep more of these things alive instead of you know allowing for a paradigm and economy of death perpetrating in the world around us. So we definitely need an attitude transformation in order to see a transformation in the world around us. Um, I've focused a lot in the past on biodiversity campaigns like this, focusing on single species that are keystone species or iconic megafauna, where if you save one elephant, they're constant gardeners, you know, they will ensure that a whole ecosystem is kept intact. So keep elephants alive and then you have the savanna intact. So I was initially working on preventing or raising awareness against the consumption of contraband, which is to say items that are illicitly procured from killing wildlife and uh, tra the transactions that happen are all sort of like in a cryptic black market situation as opposed to being approved of by governments, agencies, and it's not, it's not publicly condoned. Um, so there's a lot of wildlife trafficking that is happening in the world. And for a long while, I focused on the problem sets to raise awareness by getting people to look at the questions and the problems because you can't even come up with a solution 
if you won't look at what is happening in the world. And it's very hard to look at some things, right? Because they're so grisly and so gruesome and it shows sort of the worst of our own selves. It shows the worst of humanity. And it's hard to look that in the eye because some part of that is in you too, which is why you can't look it in the eye. And so I try to help people come face to face with sort of the worst parts of them so that in addressing and healing that within you, you're able to extend that compassion to yet others who have this broken part within them that is capable of this level of violence and destruction in a world that is at large in harmony if we weren't constantly intruding upon it and taking beyond its caring capacity means. Um, so I did a whole host of campaigns on, on this narrative arc and on this train. And then one day I realized, you know, this is not enough. Like, and so I'm constantly evolving my career path. And I would encourage anyone who cares about being involved in the conservation movement to have the same commitment to never settle for how they've approached in the past as the only way to approach something in the present. Always question where you're moving toward. And if there are aspects of you that you can evolve in order to ensure that you are doing the best you can, showing up as the fullest, highest expression of yourself in this moment. So the kind of content you create is actually relevant and is trying to bring out the highest and best expression in others. So in the beginning, while I was focusing more on problems and trying to get people's eyes on what was even happening, over time, I realized that what I really want to do is start working on communications and stories that allows for this beautiful nexus between communities on the ground or just communities at large, whether it's consumers in living in developed cities and industrial nations, and then looking at how conservation efforts can be tied in together with them and then tie in the idea of commerce, which is mostly how we intersect with the natural world. You know, it's what we need is often taken from natural resources and then we trade on that. And we trade within ourselves, but we don't account for this natural world that is giving us this infinite abundance which we think is infinite and therefore take for granted, but it's actually finite. Um, there's only so much that the world can grow within a certain period of time. There's only so much that it can give. And like or any relationship that you can have in your own life, whether it's with your mother or your boyfriend or your husband or your wife or your child, you know, you any of those relationships require reciprocity. It means that you're going to get something back to the person or thing that you're taking so much from. And if you take that for granted, then you lose it altogether, in which case you're going to be left short of what it is you were receiving so abundantly until that moment. So it's the same thing with the planet. Think of it as an individual, you know, have the same level of personalized respect for it, have the same level of personalized understanding, compassion, love, and, and um, integrity to show up in a way that enables and empowers models of mutualism and reciprocity, in which case you won't be taking biodiversity for granted, you would be triple bottom line oriented, and your business would be conscious in terms of how it accounts for the natural resources it's taken. And if it's depleting a resource, that has to be accounted for in the following year. You can't just take that for granted and assume there's still the same amount of water in that water table if you've pumped X amount of water out of it. So we can keep you know, coasting along with business as usual, saying that, oh, it's managed resource depletion because that is not going to be viable for business in five years, 10 years from now. It's not even viable right now. So I highly, like I work and highly encourage businesses to now show the same sort of stewardship and, and responsibility, accountability that we as individuals should be showing. So it's every step of the way, ensuring that all entities are showing up willingly and um, in an informed way to truly realize a mutual symbiotic relationship that empowers every stakeholder in the game. So I truly am a proponent right now of stakeholder capitalism, which is what even WEF, uh, World Economic Forum, is advocating for. And it means that you're looking at all of the participants in the system and how can you empower every one of them. No one is being short, given the short end of the stick or compromised in order for the end products or service to be realized. And I realized that like, especially with, you know, the current state of governments globally and nationally, um, and I'm not gonna say much more about that. I think the rest of you know what I'm talking about. There has been a decrease in spending towards 
you know, the right environmental stewardship being evidenced. Um, there has been a decrease in funding in terms of education. So it has been sort of a catch 22 that is disempowering those that are most in need of being enlightened. And that is disempowering the very systems that need to be given um, greater expression in order to prevent what we're currently enduring, which is the lockdown because of a pandemic. If we keep on this current path, we're going to only result in further outbreaks. Every single epidemiologist has projected for this. So it's not going to be a big surprise. I mean, the less there is of other things to infect, the more we are likely to get infected because we're the only thing left for viruses and bacteria to occupy. So it's just a matter of common sense to be able to connect these dots. Um, and this is why biodiversity is such an essential part of ensuring a healthy, safe, and prosperous world for all of us, not just humanity, but we're part of that collective of biodiversity, which is every other species, you know, from small things like earthworms in your backyard to looking at, which I have such a plenty of earthworms now, I've never, I haven't seen them in 10 years. And I'm like, can you imagine a life where you haven't seen the thing that gives you the, the integrity of soil structure? It's so weird, right? Like we take so much for granted, but that's, those are the organisms that help us grow. I now see pollinators in my backyard all the time, like bees. I have such a profound respect for bees because you can see them like so busy at work they're just born to be productive um you know farmers and like let them do their thing they're th like all the jobs that we as kids aspire to grow up to be all these animals already are and we take them for granted we don't even need to do anything in order for the world to continue along and be perfect as is we do because we want to find expression and and find the sense of uh this is what i stand for this is who i am but you know, you can just wake up and be you no matter what. Like the idea of having to do something in order to take from something else. And so we're almost taking jobs from other living organisms to be a farmer, to be an architect. Beavers have been architects long before we have. We kill them for their pelts and then we try to be architects now. You know, so it's like, it's, it's almost interesting to see how humanity has evolved into being who and how we are. Um, I would walk you through a lot more work, but you could definitely go on my website, asherj.com to see them. Uh, I'm trying to be mindful of the time as well. But um, I, mo I mostly today wanted to touch on the fact that like, you know, what is the problem that I'm really solving for at present? And that is tr to awaken entities across the board, whether it's a brand or a corporation, a nonprofit organization, uh, to come into a space of being mutually oriented towards biodiversity like conservation efforts and communities but also to the point where they're accountable and have the integrity to offer transparency the more honesty there is out there the more clarity there is out there the greater the chance at protecting that which we're all dependent on whether we realize it or not um, so i'm going to try and get back to uh hold on one second um to Wes so that you know we can do Q&A and stuff because I can just go oh no I can take care of that <laughs> I, I can uh I have a lot of passion for this stuff like I can't help it <laughs> you have a lot of passion for most everything you really invest in that's one thing no one can say about Asher J there's not a lack of passion <laughs> <laughs> um it was really wonderful to, the way that you wrapped it up too and talking about transparency and how honest communication and connection and collaboration really leads to success and I think that's a really important way to end um, and something to leave everyone with as they think about moving forward throughout the day and into tomorrow. You know, how do you help that goal of being honest, collaborative, and really working towards a common goal? It's a great, great message, I think, for at least that I'll take away from what you were talking about and the art you were showing. So I'm gonna bring in our the host for our next segment, Jesse Hildebrand. And have you all say hello really quick and, you know, have a little bit of a hangout here. It's the fun of like all of this. We've got DC, you know, Montana, and we've Hi, got Jesse joining us. Hi there. Hi. <laughs> Sorry, got West and and I'm too busy watching you, Asher, to, to actually join in. I'm too engrossed. <laughs> well, now you get to be part of the fun with us. Fantastic. So Party time. I'm so Add on to the puzzle, you know. I think we're going to get like we should get every one of the speakers all in one of these programs together before this festival is wrapped just to like blow <laughs> people's minds with just so much enthusiasm on so many amazing topics all at once now that sounds like an amazing dream zoom and also possibly the world's worst zoom because right. i know when you get above like six it's just like a cacophony of energy and yeah. no one knows what's going on 
um, Asher, go ahead, sorry. Together. No, I'm so, I was about to say that, especially since when we gather together for the Explorer Festival, you can see all of this chaotic, highly energized individuals coming into, and it's literally a supernova. I don't even know how we lived through that week. I, I don't know. It's yeah, we like, do almost every year. <laughs> <laughs> well, Asher, thank you again so much for spending time with us and sharing your art and your yeah. enthusiasm. Um, I'm going to let, let you sign off. This is the link to watch you deliver your talk. Can't wait. So looking forward to seeing the rest of this day play out online.